I was going to say, I'm going to start with a non-apology, but I already apologize. So it kind of uh, takes the rug out of under me. But the non-apology I wanted to start with is not apologizing for changing the topic of my presentation. Because when we first um, decided on the topic, it was a, at a time where I thought I would actually be able to do some writing and I would be able to create something new. And I think that it's really important to honor the situation and all of us and not put too many requirements and expectations on our own selves. So I am not apologizing for giving you a different talk, a talk that was much easier for me to come up with because it was based on a book I had already written. I still got to write a new talk, so that was fun, but it was a lot easier than coming up with a whole new set of arguments. So I'm starting with that, and I hope that it, it inspires the rest of you to not push yourself too hard um, and to honor yourself in this situation too. All right, with that being said, I am going to share my screen um, so we can see this presentation. All right, um, so let's start. Comparative psychology is um, the topic of the, the little book that, um, that came out this summer, very little book. Um, and comparative psychology is, as I understand it, broadly construed as a science that studies animal minds, cognition, affect, motivation, behavior, sociality, and that scientists who engage in comparative psychology come from a lot of different disciplines, they come from psychology and they might study memory or spatial navigation or causal reasoning. Um, they come from biology and they might study social structures or activity budgets or communication. Comparative psychologists come from anthropology and they might go into the field and study cultural traditions or tool use or social learning. And they also can come from behavioral ecology and study the um, explanations for altruistic behavior, cooperation, um, and examine dominance hierarchies. They can work in labs, they can work in zoos, they can work in the field, they can work in sanctuaries. So it's quite a large diverse group of people with lots of different background trainings. But um, like many sciences, um, the science, of comparative psychology can be traced back to Charles Darwin. Um, so contemporary, I think that contemporary comparative psychology is immensely influenced by Charles Darwin. Darwin, as you I'm sure all know, um, examined a number of different species. The finches of Galapagos are the fav famous species, but he also in The Descent of Man and the expression of, uh, uh, expression of emotions in animals and men looked at a number of species, including I just have represented a few drawings from, um, from his book, baboons, dogs, and cats. Um, but you might not know that Charles Darwin was also um, someone who studied humans and human children. And in fact, um, historians of developmental psychology um, will argue that developmental psychology started with Darwin as well. Um, so Darwin thought that it would be productive to compare animals and human children using the same metrics. This is very much along the same lines as today's con co um, comparative, uh, comparative psychologists. So at dinner parties, he used to ask his friends about their children. He used this information um, in his writings. And he's, in fact, credited with conducting the first systematic study in developmental psychology. In 1877, in the journal Mind, he published a short paper called A Biographical Sketch of an Infant. Um, and this was looking at what he thought was innate forms of communication by observing his infant son, William. So you see Darwin and William here, and these are some notes from that, from that paper. You can read the notes on his son, and what's interesting when you look at the notes, um, from what I've read, I haven't looked at them myself directly, um, but it's obvious that Darwin was keen to take a scientific stance, or a so-called scientific stance toward looking at his, his firstborn child. On occasion, he refers to William as it um, rather than he. 
This disassociation seemed to be really important to Darwin in order for him to achieve his scientific goal of distanced objectivity. So this quest for objectivity and distance is something that's well known in comparative psychology. And it's something that comparative psychologists are still strongly committed to. Darwin is often in fact criticized by contemporary um, comparative psychologists for his tendency to like jump to the most interesting hypothesis in the case of animal behavior. Um, it would be actually interesting, an interesting research project to see if he was more conservative in the hypotheses he took um, with regard to his son than he was to the non-human animals that he wrote about in The Descent of Man. Um, but this work in um, developmental psychology continued with the Darwin's early commitment to objectivity and distance um, when it came to studying both animals and children. So in early 20th century North America, comparative psychology was responding to these critiques of Darwin's kind of romanticism when it comes to animal behavior. And the behaviorists were dedicated to avoiding bias and making experimental comparative psychology a serious science. So you see here B.F. Skinner with an unnamed rat in one of his Skinner boxes and um, two of his, um, the species that were commonly studied, rats and pigeons. Um, the idea is that it doesn't really matter what the organism is, that if you give them the right learning history, you can get them to do whatever you want, um, was Skinner's idea. But they also put human infants in Skinner, <laughs> Skinner boxes in order to do objective, hard-nosed science. Um, and in fact, John Watson, the um, you know, Skinner's forerunner when it comes to behaviorism, was notorious for a number of studies that he did with children, including the little Albert study. I was going to show you a video, but I decided not to. If you're interested in uh, seeing that, you can Google it and see some interesting ways in which scientists used to study kids. But as well as studying children, Watson was also um, giving child rearing advice. This was one of my favorite um, pieces of advice for child rearing. He said, let your behavior with your own child always be objective and kindly firm. Never hug and kiss them. Never let them sit on your lap. If you must, kiss them once on the forehead when they say good night. Shake hands with them in the morning. Give them a pat on the head if they have made an extraordinarily good job of a difficult task. That's, that's how Watson thought you should raise your own child. So of course it's like objectivity and distance is something that bled from the science into, uh, into the way he was even thinking about interacting with, with children. Today things are really different. So this is an image that I just pulled off the web. It's the Arizona State University Child Development Lab. In order to do child development these days, it's been recognized that the experimenters have to develop relationships with the children if they want to get the children to participate. So when I was in grad school at the University of Minnesota, I did some studies with kids at the uh, lab daycare, and I spent one month hanging out with the kids, playing with the kids, getting to know the kids before I took the first kid out of the classroom to, um, to, to examine them. And this is what I was told that you do. You get the kids to trust you, and then you can elicit the behaviors that you want out of the children. Um, the children are treated as research partners. They are not treated as its. They are treated as agents with their own interests and their own motivation and their own inner lives. So this is a contemporary research setting and um, uh, situation when it comes to developmental psychology today. And then I went on the web and I wanted to pull out a picture of um, rats, how rats are studied today. And the first thing I found that came up was um, this advertisement from the Lab Products Inc. webpage. This is their, um, their rat housing systems that they sell to laboratories. So rats don't get to run around with other rats in a social group. They don't have a rich environment where they have things to play with and enrichment. They get to live singly housed in these shoe boxes that fit into cabinets. Um, so 
it's a stark contrast, I think, when you put these side by side. Given that Darwin uh, can be identified as the originator of both developmental psychology and comparative psychology, and Darwin started with this really conservative attitude when it came to human infants and a fairly liberal attitude when it came to non-human animals, how is it that today we're in a situation that's rather reversed? We're in a situation where we can take a quite liberal view about what humans are doing, uh, human children are doing, um, and there's not a lot of critique of adultomorphizing human children, um, where we're, though we're still stuck in worries about anthropomorphizing um, uh, uh, non-human animals and using pronouns like it to refer to research subjects when it comes to research um, to rats and pigeons and other animals who are studied. So this really leads to two kinds of questions. The first question is why did developmental psychology change so dramatically when it comes to the treatment comes to the treatment of the child um, and lose this worry about bias infecting the science um, as opposed to comparative psychology so this kind of historical question that's an interesting question um, i hope someone will investigate and take up i'm going to take up the second question and that is that whether question number two is, can we do better comparative psychology by changing the methods still taught to students today? That is, will the science improve if it becomes more like developmental psychology um, and less like what it looks like right now? So in order to uh, answer that second question, I turn to look at how students are being trained in comparative psychology today. And so I was, I was looking at the textbooks that the students, um, students use when they're taught as undergraduates, comparative psychology. The three textbooks are very widely used. Um, I did a very unscientific survey of people I know, comparative psychologists I know. I asked them, what do you teach? What do you use to teach? Um, these were the three most common books that were mentioned. Uh, though it is also telling um, from a philosophy of science perspective that a lot of my colleagues don't use textbooks at all. They come up with, even at an undergraduate level, they come up with reading um, lists on their own. Um, so using these textbooks, I decided I was going to um, examine um, how, to, how today Comparative psychologists are taught to study animal minds and look to see whether there might be better ways of teaching students how to study animal minds if the science, uh, if the science could be improved in these ways. So this project is actually, it's, it's a philosophy of science project and it's grounded in feminist philosophy of science. Um, though it's not explicit in the book, it's certainly implicit there. So the book is really uh, something that emerged from my reading and appreciation of work by philosophers and scientists like Evelyn Fox Keller and Mary Midgley and Helen Longineau, who was one of my advisors at Minnesota, um, as well as Ron Geary, who was my supervisor at Minnesota, who thought that the way you could study science, the way the philosophers of science, science should study science is look at textbooks and look to see what students are in fact being taught. Um, and so there's a lot of this work comes from um, my background and training and appreciation of the ideas of these four people. So in the, in the book, I had a number of different aims. Um, four aims, four chapters, four aims. It's a, it's, it's a little book, see, very small. <laughs> um, and the aims were to examine the methods of comparative psychology, including what I identified as the three principles of comparative psychology that are taught to students to follow. These are anti-anthropomorphism, or don't be anthropomorphic, Morgan's canon, or prefer simpler explanations over more complex ones, whatever that means. Um, and anti-anthropocentrism, which is don't look at animals from a human-centric position. In the book, I argue that we should reject the first two and only keep the third. The second aim in the book is to show that animals should be presumed to be conscious beings, 
rather than presume to be non-sentient, rather than ignoring consciousness. And that's going to be the topic of this talk. Um, the third aim is to identify how training and comparative psychology creates biases through an emphasis on avoiding biases, such as the bias against forming relationships with research subjects. So one of the things that I think feminist philosophy of science is really good at identifying is that when, when humans are doing science, they are bringing their human biases to their science. Bias is inevitable. It's, it's a perspective. And what we need to do rather than try to avoid biases is to acknowledge the biases that exist and how our choices about how we're doing the science is cre are creating biases. Um, and then in the fourth chapter, I illustrate the biases in ape cognition studies that you see in the field and in the lab. There's a lot of debate. Um, there's some debate at least between field researchers and lab researchers about who's got better methods when it comes to figuring out what the cognitive capacities of chimpanzees and bonobos and orangutans are. Um, and I think that there are definitely benefits of both approaches and there are biases in both approaches. And I think having them out on the table and acknowledging what them, those are could be really productive to um, making uh, for a, a better more fecund science. But as I said, I can't talk about all of that. So I'm just going to uh, today talk about the consciousness piece um, and, and make this argument, show you, show you all this argument that I'm putting forth in the book. So let's do that. So one thing that you might be a, a little bit surprised to find out is that um, psychologists in these textbooks uh, eschew consciousness talk. They, if you look in the indexes, um, there's like one or two pages in which consciousness even occurs and you get comments like this. This is from John Pierce's textbook. We're frustrated by the lack of methodology to determine if animal consciousness is actually true because it's not possible to observe directly the mental states of an animal. Whether these tools will ever be adequate is a matter for debate, which I suspect will be waged for many years to come. And Pierce made these comments in response to the metacognition research that Rob Hampton is engaged in. These are pictures from his lab. Um, and the metacognition studies are looking at um, whether or not uh, subjects know when they know something or know when they don't know something. They can choose to avoid answering a question when they don't have the information. Um, the same way we are able to say, I don't know when we're asked something um, and we don't have the information. We know when we need to study hard for a test and know when we uh, have the information down and don't have to practice at all. The question is, do non-human animals have these abilities as well too? And Pierce is super skeptical that we can get at anything like this um, because he thinks that this is trying to figure out something that's not, not observable. Now, you know, we can just mention that all uh, psychology, unless you're a behaviorist, is going to appeal to unobservables. <laughs> and that's what science does. Physics also appeals to unobservables. But, you know, we'll, we'll come back to this, that kind of point. So that's from John Pierce, um, the Clive Wynn um, and Monique Udell textbook. They say of consciousness, it seems positively foolhardy for an animal psychologist to blunder in where even philosophers fear to tread. Um, and like, so we're basically, they mention consciousness, say we're not gonna mention consciousness. There's nothing that we have to say here. And then Sarah Shuttleworth, which is uh, her textbook is perhaps the most widely used um, textbook. She wrote, writes near the beginning of her book, because evidence for consciousness in humans generally consists of what people say about their mental experiences, seeking it in nonverbal species requires us to accept some piece of the animal's behavior as equivalent to a person's verbal report. Therefore, the point of view of most animal, most researchers studying animal cognition is that how animals possess information can and should process information can and should be analyzed without making any assumptions about what their private experiences are like. This approach takes support from evidence that people act without using reflective consciousness more often than is commonly realized. 
So given, given these sorts of comments, when you turn to the textbooks, you can see that, that students are being discouraged from talking about consciousness, investigating consciousness, appealing to consciousness as a variable in research. It is something that is generally to be avoided. Uh, one of the things that people don't do, the authors of these textbooks don't really do, is, is give a much of a definition of consciousness or sentience um, is another word that is sometimes used by more and more of these days uh, to, to refer to the same sorts of ideas. Uh, what you do get at best is a reference to Nagel's What It Is Like to Be a Bat Paper, which comparative psychologists like a lot. Um, so you might ask me, okay, Kristen, can you define consciousness or sentience for me? And I am going to be following Eric Schwitzkobel here and say, I think that, I think defining consciousness is already um, tied up in having a theory of consciousness. And so the best we can do right now is to have a definition by example. So in order to be clear about what, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about consciousness or sentience, I'm going to use those words interchangeably um, here, are things like sensory experiences, the taste of watermelon or the smell of cut grass, um, imagery experiences, mental imagery, closing your eyes and seeing the clouds move in your, eye, in your uh, mind emotional experiences of joy or experiences of pain or pleasure, um, dreams, those sorts of things. What consciousness is not are hormone releases, dispositional knowledge, standing intentions or responses to masked intentions, nor is it metacognition, planning or theory of mind. So we're really talking about these kind of experiences um, and whether um, we can say anything and whether we should be saying anything or whether we should be thinking anything about animal experiences. Um, so the, the move I want to make is to argue that we ought to be thinking about animal experiences when we're doing science of animal psych uh, comparative psychology. Um, because we're thinking about experiences when we're doing human psychology. And what I did in the book is I came up with what I'm calling a curative principle for comparative psychology in order to figure out when we should be thinking about animal um, consciousness. And this is a statement of it. When ignoring consciousness hinders the ability to generate new knowledge of animal mind and behavior. And when there is the potential to generate new knowledge by premising consciousness, scientists ought to take the starting premise that the animals they study are conscious. So this is not to say that we need, to, that scientists need to prove that animals are conscious. Um, it does not mean that animals, that scientists have to decide where the line is on whether sponges are conscious or sea cucumbers or anything like that. The comment is merely that if premising consciousness of your research subject, whatever it is, helps generate new knowledge, then you ought to do it. And, um, and I think that there are a number of reasons for thinking that premising consciousness does in fact help the science. Um, and I've identified these five ways. So by premising animal consciousness, when you're designing your study and engaging in the research and at every stage of, of your research, the first thing that it allows you to do is it allows, it increases the number of topics that are open to study. So if consciousness is off the table, then you're not going to be able to go to your supervisor and say, I'd like to study um, the experience of dreams in animals. That is going to be a topic that's off the table. If, it's, if consciousness is really off the table, then studies of pain in animals would also be off the table because that's an emotional experience. Um, if you wanted to study episodic memory in animals, your supervisor would say, oh, you can only study episodic like uh, memory in animals because human episodic memory is, also has a, a consciousness element of re-experiencing something that happened in the past, and we can't talk about that. 
So for some of these topics, you, you actually do see the scientists saying, we're only gonna talk about episodic like memory. We can't talk about episodic memory. But on other of these, you see scientists saying, oh, I'm gonna talk about pain. I think it's totally fine to talk about pain. Uh, and there's been a, quite a, a large research on animal pain that we'll come to in a little bit. The second way is that by promising that animals are conscious, your research subjects are conscious to begin with, you're in, going to be in a better position to recognize which variables might be relevant to your, your study. So for example, if you can talk about the sensory experience of an animal, then you can ask, did the animal just have a relevant sensory experience, like a bad dream? Is the animal experiencing depression or fear of something in the environment? Does the housing methods, um, do the housing methods affect the sorts of responses you're getting from the animal? Uh, these are questions that will just come to mind if you think that your animal is a conscious being as opposed to a stone that isn't going to be affected by moods, um, sentiments, or fear or the environment. And because you can better recognize these um, relevant variables, you're able to create, this is the third one, better create eliciting conditions in um, the um, experiments and study situations. So for example, in the Ape Theory of Mind research program, this is something that's, that was started in the 1970s theory of mind in chimpanzees um, was not something that, that was found until um, four years ago. It took scientists 40 years to figure out what kind of eliciting conditions could get a chimpanzee or an orangutan to track somebody's false belief. Um, and the, the scientists who figured out to do it were the scientists who, um, who were from the Kyoto Res um, Primate Research Institute where they have these lifetime commitments with the, the chimpanzees they work with. Um, so it's got, there's a kind of a special idea about the relationships matter between the uh, human scientists and the, and the chimpanzees. They figured out that chimpanzees really like violence. And if you give them a false belief test that involve violence, they'll care about that. But if you give them a false belief test about like moving a piece of food from one place to another, they don't care about that, that's boring. Violence, that's fun. Um, so eliciting conditions, um, uh, like that's what you want in order to get a successful experiment. You want to be able to motivate your, uh, your research subjects, participants. Um, you also want to pay attention to the relationship between the experimenter and the research subject. Um, do they have a good relationship or not? When I was working at the Koala Basin Marine Mammal Laboratory, um, which is a dolphin research lab in Hawaii, they uh, used to call in um, a woman who was a volunteer when they had a really important experiment because Akea Kamai really liked her and would do anything for her. Uh, it was very motivating to work with this particular human. Also, if you're trying to ask animals to work together, you wanna know about their relationships. Uh, are they gonna be motivated to work together or do they have a bad relationship that will affect the um, outcome of the study? Um, fourth, one of the benefits, another benefit, is that if you premise conscious experience of animals, then you are in a better position to make claims about continuity and discontinuity of various cognitive capacities, affective capacities, and so on, um, between humans and non-human animals. Because we are premising that humans are conscious, um, we do not directly see human consciousness unless you uh, are a kind of behavior reader sort of a sort of a uh, mindset probably think we're not directly seeing one another's conscious experiences either um yet we just premise it um so i think the same starting premises are really important if you want to make comparative claims um, between different subjects and then finally i think of course that you're going to get better welfare considerations um, if you consider your research subjects as conscious so these are five reasons why I think that promising consciousness is, it would be really good for the science. Um, but there are challenges, of course. There are, um, I think 
we can identify three kind of main lines of worry that people have about starting with the assumption that animals are conscious. Um, and we'll go through each of these, the skeptical argument, the agnostic argument, and the language argument. So the skeptical argument is pretty, um, is, a, is, is the kind of knee jerk sort of argument I've heard sometimes that conscious experience can only be, be known via first person introspection. I can only know that I'm conscious through introspecting my own experiences. I can't introspect anybody else's experiences, much less an animal's experience, so I can't know it. Um, and I think that the only way to um, respond to this sort of skepticism is to make the point that there is nothing different when it comes to this worry when it, with non-human animals and other humans. And the fact that other humans um, are able, that humans are able to assume that other humans are conscious, we, sh we shouldn't have a higher bar when it comes to non-human animals. But this sort of worry is something that you see expressed in, in the textbooks. So for example, this is a quote from John Pierce's textbook again. Um, he says, the temptation to attribute human feeling and experiences to animals remains to this day. Roger Fouts, who um, was a psychologist who worked with chimp the chimpanzee Washoe um, and other chimpanzees who had learned um, ASL signs to communicate. Um, he's, he quotes, Pierce quotes Fouts as saying, when I looked into Washoe's eyes as an infant, she caught my gaze and regarded me thoughtfully, just like my own son did. There was a person inside that ape costume. And in those moments of steady eye contact, I knew that Washoe was a child." End quote. Then Pierce goes on, to labor the point that had just been made, it is possible that Washoe had similar mental experiences to a child. But it is also possible that Washoe had a very different type of mental experience or no mental experience at all. Gazing into her eyes will not resolve this issue. Now, imagine somebody um, who was doing anthropology, walked into a community and didn't, wasn't able to communicate with a human from that community and said, maybe they don't think any, have any experience at all. It would be a shockingly horrific thing to do when it comes to other humans. And it's something that we are able to do in the sciences of anthropology. It's something that we're able to do in, um, in disorders of consciousness studies as well. We're able to examine how, um, uh, what kinds of signals and, and markers of conscious experience exist that allow us to premise consciousness in other humans, even though we do not directly see other humans' conscious experience. Um, so because the skeptical problem is really a philosophical problem, it's not an empirical problem, and it's not defeasible given any empirical evidence, I think this problem falls outside of the domain of science. And I think that comments like what Pierce made about maybe Washoe feels nothing at all is, um, is more of a philosophical commitment and not a scientific um, position to be taking at all, given the way other creatures who are not using language, other human creatures who are not using language um, can be considered to be conscious, even in um, cultures where people don't talk about mental states, presumed to be conscious. Um, so I think that the skeptical argument is perhaps the, the weakest uh, worry that we have there's a much, I think, stronger concern, and this comes from Marianne Dawkins. I'm calling it the agnostic argument. So Dawkins is, a, as I'm sure you know, an animal welfareist, and she argues that you don't need to consider animal consciousness in order to do good animal welfare work. And I, I present her argument along these lines. I think that she's basically suggesting that the science and philosophy of consciousness isn't mature enough to draw any conclusions about which beings are and are not conscious. And that's a, what I'm calling a theoretical reason. And two, she thinks that we can protect an animal's welfare best by not presuming that they're conscious. And that's what I'm calling her practical reason. And um, 
that if they're both theoretical and practical reasons against presuming animal consciousness, then we ought to remain agnostic about animal consciousness. So, so we should remain agnostic. So I want to quickly look at the premises. Um, this first premise that the science and philosophy of consciousness isn't mature enough to draw any conclusions. Again, we are already committed to conscious experiences in humans across cultures, in humans with disorders of consciousness, in human infants who are unable to use language. Um, so I, I think that to say we need a theory in order to make these distinctions is in fact putting kind of putting the cart before the horse. What we need to do is identify which sorts of entities fulfill our understanding of consciousness in order to, and study them in order to get the diversity of range of types of conscious experience in order to develop any kind of theory, theoretical understanding of, of consciousness. Premise two is, I think, requires a, a lot more attention. Premise two is, is this practical claim that we can better protect animal welfare by not presuming they're conscious, that they have conscious experiences. So Dawkins' argument goes along these lines. Since we don't know whether or what sorts of conscious experience animals have, by considering their feelings, it would be just as likely we'd unknowingly harm an animal as it is that we'd help. I think she's worried here about anthropocentrism and thinking that the animal's gonna be experiencing the same sorts of things as we would experience in a given sorts of situation. And so it's, it, we can be misled um, by our kind of a, our knee jerk um, anthropocentrism. Um, so, Instead, what she suggests we do is use two things, health and having what one wants in order to measure welfare outcomes. And health she defines as longevity, a lack of pathological self-harming responses, and um, reduced immune responses. These are all measurable. Um, and having what one wants, she defines in terms of giving an animal's preference tasks and then giving them um, the opportunity to have those things that they choose, be it water, light, um, enrichment act activities and objects and so on and so forth. Um, so what I think, I, what I wanna say about this is that I think that what Dawkins is doing here is suggesting that health and having what one wants um, is, using those to measure welfare is sneaking in um, intrinsic goods, intrinsic goods that are experiential for the animal. If health and having what one wants isn't something that is something that gives the animal a more positive experience, then it's not clear why these would be benefits. What is the value of these sorts of things? Um, so I think Dawkins has helped herself to instrumental goods without specifying any intrinsic goods. And that, that means that there's always going to be an open question as to whether her instrumental goods are really goods at all. Um, so I'm not too concerned about, about this argument either. I think that furthermore, we, ha we can have some issues with both health and having what one wants that I discuss a bit in the book. I mean, if you give a preference task to me and you make me choose between, say, two presidential candidates and I don't like either of them, um, it doesn't really mean that I like the guy I vote for because that's my worst, my least worst choice, right? <laughs> that is not really my preference. Um, so there are a number of, of little issues I have with that as well. Um, but that's all I really want to say right now about this agnostic argument. Um, and then we'll, we can turn to the language argument. And the language argument is, we, we saw Sarah Shuttleworth um, presenting this idea earlier um, in the quote I gave you about why we should avoid talking about animal consciousness. And I can see the argument going along these lines that language is a good evidential basis for knowing what one feels. And the animals lack language and presumably any other method for expressing what they feel. And if we don't have any good evidential basis for knowing what one feels, then we shouldn't study their consciousness. So let's avoid talking about animal consciousness in um, comparative psychology. Uh, we see this, a similar sort of claim and worry again in Pierce. Um, so Pierce says, in the case of humans, um, 
we infer that someone is experiencing a state of uncertainty by asking them, but we are unable to ask monkeys about their uncertainty state, about their mental states, and even if we were able to ask them, it would be impossible to know if they were telling the truth in their responses to our questions. I, I am not sure that I'm any more worried about monkeys lying to me than I am about humans lying to me in, in um, scientific experiments. Um, but I think it's important to, to bring this up because Pierce's worry is in fact um, undermining the language argument itself. Because even for verbal humans, we lie, we can fabulate, we get things wrong, right? A drug seeking patient will say I have pain in my lower back and an observant doctor can notice that the markers of pain are missing and say, actually, you don't have pain in, in your lower back, but you do have other symptoms that indicate that you might be addicted to painkillers and we can help you with that instead. Um, so I think that's worth pointing out about the language argument. Um, Though, of course, it's true that language is a marker of consciousness. If someone comes up to me and says I'm conscious, I'm not going to challenge them. I think it would be pretty rude to say, no, no, you're not. Actually, prove it to me. You're not conscious. If aliens came down and, and said, hello, nice to meet you. I'm very excited to see you. It's like, no, you're not excited. You don't have any experiences. Prove it to me. Um, it's a pretty good language. It's a pretty good marker of consciousness. And it's, it's the, the one that we clearly use a lot. Um, but it's only one of them. And when we're looking for markers of unobservables, relying on only one marker is going to be a weak um, basis of evidence. So I think instead it's much helpful, much more helpful to look at other markers of, of consciousness and to ask what are the ways, what are the things that trigger in humans a perception that someone is conscious? Um, so we have other evidential bases of consciousness. We have um, them that we've developed for practical purposes. So I've mentioned a couple of times disorders of consciousness. You, we wanna know when somebody who has a disorder of consciousness um, who looks like they're not responsive and not experiencing anything, whether they really have an experience. And what um, practitioners have done is looked for neural functions in areas of sensory processing or brain areas of language processing, responses to familiar voices and things like this, and have come up with um, clinical criteria for deciding whether to treat um, a human as having a disorder of consciousness. As well, their um, clinicians have come up with the infant's post-operative pain scale you might not, you might be surprised to know that until the 80s, infants um, in North America were not thought to have pain experience. We're not giving, given analgesics before operations. And um, it took a real uh, uh, human rights effort um, by a mother who witnessed her son getting an operation without any analgesics to change the practice of um, pediatrics in North America to say, no, no, actually, they're conscious. <laughs> we can't treat them as if they're not conscious because we're doing real harms. And so these infant post-operative pain scales uses observable markers such as facial expressions, crying, restlessness, bod bodily posture, and things like that. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of research has been done on pain in non-human animals. And of course, pain is an, is an emotional experience that is not directly observable there are a lot of markers for pain that we know about because of this science. And all of these, um, I don't need to go through all these markers for, with you right now, but I think it's important to know that all mammals, all birds, and all reptiles have these markers of pain. And that um, some philosophers like Michael Ty and Gary Varner argue that because they have all these markers of pain, we should conclude that they're conscious. Um, also, if you look at other taxa, fish, cephalopods, and sea slugs, crustaceans, nem nematodes, leeches, and flies have at least some of these markers of pain. So marker, of course, isn't something that, you, like none of it is going to be a necessary condition, especially given multiple realizability, but having some of the markers of pain can be sufficient for someone who's looking for evidence for consciousness and something to conclude that they're conscious. Now, I, I find it interesting that 
this work has been focused on pain. Um, there's also a, a way we could we could be looking for pleasure markers instead of pain markers. So studying um, correlates of the pain markers um, when it comes to pleasure in non-human animals. Um, so again, looking for behaviors um, behaviors both in external um, you know observable behavior like trade-offs to reward stimuli, whether you're going to go towards something that you prefer, whether you're attract attracted to certain kind of stimuli, but also looking at um, physiological measures, um, looking at self-administration of certain drugs, looking at um, the same sorts of things that the scientists look for in, in pain. So I think that actually there's a move towards for, for comparative psychologists to look at pleasure. I think they're tired of just focusing on pain and bee venom and the lips of poor little fish and then watching them rub their, their, their lips on the bottom of a tank because it hurts. Give them something that makes them happy instead and watch what they do then uh, is, a, is maybe more fun thing to do in the lab. All right, but the, um, these marker approaches, I think, are a really good starting point but I think that we need a little bit of theorizing about how markers work and what to do with markers in order to um, think about if you want to decide whether something is conscious or not, how you would use it. And I think that what would be, what would be um, a useful way to start is to study human perception of conscious experience, of conscious beings. And what of course, um, we we will find out is that a lot of just morphological features and a lot of um, behavioral features reflect our commitment to an, not, uh, a human or a non-human animal being conscious. Starting with these observable markers, then we can investigate less visible correlates of those behavioral markers and see where whether they exist in, say, the aliens that come down from space or from for uh, the um, the leech or the sea cucumber, um, and the goal would be perhaps then to develop a family resemblance relationship of the markers, none of which would be um, necessary, uh, but um, taken together could be some evidence of conscious consciousness. So, I mean, this is my response to oh, and here's some potential initial markers that we could use in developing the dynamic marker approach. So the, I'm gonna skip that. So the response to the language argument that I wanna give is that language is one marker of consciousness. There's other, there are other markers of consciousness as well, and we shouldn't just focus on one. Focusing on one is too weak, and we already know that there are some, um, some beings that humans take to be conscious, some human beings that humans take to be conscious who fail when it comes to the language marker as well. Um, so in short, I want to return to this claim that we have these gains from premising consciousness. The curative principle suggests that there are gains from premising consciousness. We have to premise consciousness. That we don't need to use the marker thing to get started in doing our science. We should premise consciousness and then if we want to study consciousness and the types of consciousness and the degrees of, you know, different sorts of um, sensory experience, experiences possible and so on and so forth, that's, that's fabulous. That's a fabulous research program. Um, but start with the assumption that there's some experience there. We have these benefits. Um, the cost, I think, that we, we have to confront is, is quite minimal. There's a risk of a crude anthropomorphic bias to think that the animals are going to be just like us. Um, and I think that we can avoid this risk of crude anthropomorphic bias by teaching students to, um, to avoid thinking that every animal is going to look at the world the way they look like they look at the world the same way we teach anthropologists to avoid their cultural biases by thinking that all the cultures they study are going to see the world just the same way that individual from their cultural background their gender identity their racial experience their sexual identity all of this um, how that shapes the way they see the world and if we can do this within the social sciences when it comes to other humans, I think we can do this when it comes to non-human animals as well.
Now I was going to close with three cases, but I, and my time is up. And uh, so I'll just briefly mention that I think that there have been, you know, there are some nice examples of, of, of science research programs that have kind of gone wrong because um, conscious experience wasn't premised. One of them is in these ape language um, uh, studies in the um, late part of the 20th century. Um, these studies are not going to be done by anyone anymore because of the ethical issues with taking chimpanzee babies away from their moms and raising them <laughs> in a house. Um, but what we, we did learn quite a lot from Roger Fouts's research. And if you get a chance to read Next of Kin, it's a page turner. It's fabulous. There are evil villains. There's like drama galore in this book. It's it's a beautiful piece of science writing. Um, Elizabeth Hess's Nim Chimsky is also full of drama. You might have seen the documentary. Um, but what comes out of this is that the research that's done by the scientists who had a close relationship with the chimpanzees were, was completely dismissed, whereas the research that came out of um, the lab where nobody had a relationship with Nim Chimsky, research um, uh, experimenters came and went. That's the one that got the press. That's the one that killed the ape language research program, stopped all the funding to Fouts' project, and in fact made him scramble to take care of animals for the rest of their lives. There are still two living outside of Montreal right now at the Fauna Foundation. If you can, you can Google Fauna Foundation. Um, Mary Lee Jenshold runs that. She was a student of Fouts's, and she's doing a fabulous job there. Um, but that's one cautionary tale. Another cautionary tale is um, Jack Panksepp's early funding troubles. He wanted to study dogs. Um, he wanted to um, study attachment, use attachment theory to study dogs. And he was told in the 1970s that he was crazy and would not get any funding for this kind of research because of course attachment theory has no place when it comes to non-human animals. Um, Panksepp was the, the guy who discovered rat laughter. So that's why he's there with the rat. But it segues to the third case. And this is um, an article, Susanna Monceau, and I wrote for Aeon Magazine about rats and the welfare of, um, of rat studies compared to welfare in chimpanzee studies because of the very differing attitudes um, that people have towards chimpanzees um, and monkeys who are like us, um, thought to be like us, um, and rats, which are seen as, as pests and things to be avoided. And we see very, very, very different legal and in practice welfare considerations that fall out of that. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but uh, I, I guess I had more to say than I thought. Thanks so much for your attention and I'm super happy to discuss this with you. Thanks.